Hello everybody, Road Warriors 627 here and welcome back to another Thoroughbred Racing Preview here on my channel. Today we're going to be talking about the last leg of the 2020 Triple Crown. The Belmont, oh wait a second, no it's not the Belmont, they ran that what? Three, four months ago? It's Preakness time in October. Makes a lot of sense. Nothing makes sense this year, but that's okay. This came up an awfully tough race, so I obviously can't analyze it alone. Today we've got Sammy Roseman. I'm back. Okay, and Jack from the Racing Rundown podcast. And uh, given that today, given today we're talking about one of the truly great days in, in horse racing in terms of, you know, on track event, uh, you know, it, it just before we get into this, it, it is a pro it seemed appropriate to me to take light of one truly landmark day that happened uh, in, in the terms of betterment and future of this game. Uh, if anyone isn't uh, super following the, the reformation efforts in horse racing that have been going on uh, for the past number of years, uh, which were definitely uh, put under the microscope by uh, some of the unfortunate events that happened last year. Uh, around the country, but specifically at Santa Anita. Uh, today, uh, the U.S. House of Representatives passed the Horse Racing Integrity Act, uh, which is obviously means a landmark in, in terms of it reforming the industry. And, you know, just, just want to briefly recognize the people who were involved in this, you know, uh, who the two senators, or two congressmen, excuse me, uh, Paul Tonko and Andy Barr from New York and Kentucky, respectively, who brought this to the floor last year uh, to all the you know, other senators who have come out with their support of it, uh, even to Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, just for the, the effort that these people have put into reforming this truly great uh, industry. It, it's a really, r really landmark day for the industry. It's really good to see uh, these efforts, which have taken many years, and they weren't just tr they weren't just stuck in 2019 with just coming out of this as a direct response to the events at Santa Anita, they were, had started many years before that, but culmination of many years of effort, truly a great day. A great day, and this is also a great day, and we're, we're very happy that you're watching this video, and you're, you're not currently watching the presidential debate, the first presidential debate. I think, though, our show might not be great, it'll still be better than the garbage that's spewed on both sides. Anyway, let's get into the show today. We're going to be talking about 11 three-year-olds going a mile and three-sixteenths at Pimlico. How long is it going to stay at Pimlico? Hopefully forever, but who knows. Uh, let's start with number one, Accession. So I'm going to start off here, a little bit of a change from the last couple of times. Uh, Accession, it, you know, you look at his past performances, they don't look super good. He does have the one good finish. Uh, in the Rebel, but a lot of things had to go really right for him that day. He had to have basically a, a speed meltdown up front, and you know, if Nadal, the now retired Bob Baffert runner, wasn't such a freaky animal, maybe he would have been able to just bring a huge upset uh, in the Rebel, but uh, all that being mentioned, he was only second best that day, but he hasn't run since the Rebel. Now, the one good thing that I can say about him is he will be coming late, uh, and you know, with the Preakness looking like there is going to be more of, I don't want to say more of a pace than there was in the Derby because the Derby was definitely fast, but uh, there will be more of an early speed presence than there was in the Kentucky Derby. So he will be coming. It's just a question of, is he going to be able to come soon enough uh, and, you know, be able to be better than some of the other more talented closers that exist in this race? The race is going to set up for him. I just really do not know. I just do not like the layoff and he was, he didn't get back to the work cap for six months. I just think there's going to be a lot a lot of things that are going to have to set up for him. I just don't like him, and I think there's better options for value in this race. I, I think there's better options, too. Uh, Accession's one of three for Steve Asmussen. One thing I got to say, I, I don't like the layoff, but he must be training like a beast. Otherwise, why would he be running this horse here? Uh, it's kind of a weird... How you met? It's kind of weird considering when he's already got two other horses in here. Uh, so he must feel that he can, that this horse can at least bring a check to the barn for getting fourth, fifth, or sixth. Uh, because, uh, I, look, I wasn't able to throw out pretty much anybody in here. This is a very wide open race, a race that took me almost an hour to go through. He's got a chance to uh, come running late, like Sammy said, but 
is he good enough for my top four? He's not. Not to cut Andrew off here, but one more historical angle, because I do like to throw some of those things in there. If you're a fan of playing owners, Calumet horses, for some reason, uh, Brad Kelly does like to enter a lot of horses in grade one races that don't necessarily have the best chance to do well in that race. But uh, Pimlico and Calumet have been a good combination the last decade uh, with the last two years. With the last two years, uh, seeing big long big long shot Calumet runners uh, running second, uh, those being ever fast in Bravazo. And as Andrew mentioned, Oxbow uh, winning a race where he probably uh, maybe should not have won the race. Uh, shout out my friend Gary Stevens for that that ride that he had there. But Cal- Calumet horses tend to run well at Pimlico. So if you like the history with that, that's another angle you can look at. But th- that that's just, uh, you know, kind of trying to grasping at straws there with him. Yeah, I think Calumet, they have good success, success in the quickness. I just really do not. Like this horse, oh. yeah. He's he, faced some good horses. Give him credit. Yeah, he's Even faced good training. horses. He's just he's a little slow. The slop helped him a lot. He he seems to run a lot better on the slop. Okay, so number two is Mister Big News, who was a flying set uh third, excuse me, in the Kentucky Derby, putting up a career best one hundred one Brisnet figure, coming from way off the pace. In a race where it was dominated by two horses that were close to the front end. Does Mr. Big News have another performance in his arsenal like that? Well, Mr. Big News, throughout the course of this year, uh, you, you look at the Bluegrass Stakes, that wasn't a bad sixth-place finish. If you can go to go, if you go back to my preview that I did about him specifically, I talked about how there were some things that I saw in him, but I wasn't really sure if he would be able to string it together and had the talent to you know, be one of those horses that had, is extremely overlooked on the odds board, but still runs a, a big race. Uh, but, uh, you know, obviously my initial feelings of thinking that he had something more validated because he did run back to that form that he had in the Oakland States. And, you know, it wasn't like there was a speed meltdown up front. You know, the, the two top horses, the two top horses were pretty close the whole time and authentic never backed up. Uh, you know, Mr. Big News, Kind of around the far turn, it looked like he was making a lot better of a move and he flattened out a little bit. Uh, you, you know, that's not to say that he can't do something like that again at Pimlico, but uh, it, it's just the, the kind of an ex- example of a horse that runs a big race in the Kentucky Derby that, you know, the long shots to do that have never really produced at Pimlico with big results following that up. Looking at Lee is one that I'm thinking of specifically. He ran his ultra good second and then bombed out completely in the Preakness. So I'm not, I don't have too much faith in him, but I do think there is a lot of upside with him. I agree. He did, he did flatten out in the derby. If you go watch that replay, but yeah, I just great. I think he just, he was just an example of that horse that was 50 to one, 60 to one, that always runs second, third, or fourth in the Kentucky Derby, and I just did not really like him in this race. I think last time was your time to make money with him. I think the va- the value being down here kills his ability to be played. Uh, do you expect uh, now? Jack likes to bring up historical angles. How often do you see those horses that come up with big runs in the Derby to hit the board come back and run the same race again? Hardly ever. And uh, I'm going to take twelve to one on a horse that's going to be. Pretty far back in here. Now, I do think the pace is going to be a little contentious in here. And I'm not going to be picking somebody that's right on the lead. Spoiler alert. I'm going to have somebody that's kind of mid-pack, maybe forward mid-pack. Uh, I don't want somebody coming from this far back at Pimlico. No thanks. Number three is Art Collector. Undefeated this year. A lot of people like him. Sure, a lot of people don't like the price at five to two. What do you think, Jack? Is he in your mix? There wasn't necessarily a horse that I I included in my top four, but he's definitely going to be a big factor of this race. I said it coming going into the Kentucky Derby that he was him not being in the Kentucky Derby was a major factor to how the race turned out, and it really changed the dynamic of the race. And I think Art Collector fairly similar to what I thought he was going to be in the Derby. I think he's a real linchpin horse uh, in terms of the Preakness this year. He's obviously going to be really close to the lead. And, you know, given that Authentic was able to do what he did in the Kentucky Derby going as fast, and it obviously didn't get to him uh, the degree that people thought it was going to get to him. Art Collector maybe forced him to go a little bit faster, uh, c- could tip the balance. But Art Collector, you know, going into the Derby, 
always seemed like a very perplexing horse to me because he's coming on a five straight, uh, crossing the wire first five straight times. He was disqualified uh, in the first race of that span, but uh, and that was due to a medication violation, nothing uh, in the stretch of the, the race uh, interference wise. But last four races have been good. He's beaten, you know, obviously he beat Swiss Skydiver, who we know what she's done this year. She came back following that second place finish in the Bluegrass, won the Alabama. Uh, Shared Sense is another good horse that he's beaten. Uh, Shared Sense this past weekend came back and won the Oklahoma Derby at Remington. But outside of those two, there's really not much overall talent that Art Collector's been beating. You know, the two horses that he beat, uh, second and third in the Ellis Park Derby, Attachment Rate and Necker Island, both ran very dud races uh, in the Kentucky Derby. And it's just, for me, Art Collector has never really faced the likes of a horse like Authentic, who... You know, I, I'm going to mention this many times throughout this preview. I think Authentic is a freaky horse, uh, being able to do what he did in the Kentucky Derby. And I just don't see, going back to the uh, po- past performances, excuse me, and I'm not a big person that likes to judge a horse purely based on the company that they've beaten, but I don't really see any freaks that this horse has run against. And I think he's going to have to run way better than he did in the Ellis Park Derby to be able to beat Authentic here. I agree. This is the biggest tough this is the toughest ask ask they've seen from him he he was being what did he beat four horse fields four and five horse fields going into the bluegrass or was it four four or five i think i believe it was four he shared sense who won the oklahoma derby i just do not like where he's going to be situated in the preakness i think he's going to be right off the pace and i just do not think it's going to benefit him I'm going to disagree with both of you, and I think he's a major, major player in this race. And you know I don't like to use favorites. Here's what I looked at in the past performances. His last two races, he's been on or close to the front, and they've pretty much been carbon copies of each other as far as the fractions. 46 and 3, 110 and 3, 135 and 1. I think the pace is going to be contentious, but do you really think he's going to have to go much faster than that? Now, I realize different tracks, different surfaces. This is a very talented horse, and his last three races have been ultra consistent. He's going to probably, in my thought, be on or near the lead. I have this little hand-drawn pace projector right here that I'm going to put on. I'm going to flash it on the screen for a few moments here. You could see that I have Art Collector on the inside near the front. Now, the two horses to his inside aren't going to be part of the early pace. So he's going to have forward position on the rail. That's a tremendous advantage historically at Pimlico, or pretty much in any two-turn dirt route race, or any two-turn route race on any surface. I really like Art Collector in here. The only problem is, does the pace get faster than I think it's going to be? Obviously, I don't think it's going to be. But if they start pressing him, if New York traffic presses him, if Swiss Skydiver's up there, if Authentic presses him, he's going to be in trouble. However, I think from those last two races, you could say he might be good enough to hang on on that position uh, for the majority of the race. The last two races are both a mile and an eighth. He's only got to go a sixteenth of a mile further. I'm not really too worried about it. He's my second choice. Number four is the Philly Swiss Skydiver. And looking at Swiss Skydiver, this for me is actually a very perplexing entry uh, for trainer Kenny McPeak. Obviously, he knows the horse and I don't, but uh, at least for me, in in the perspective of looking at where her career this year was trending, it seemed like that she was, you know, especially after losing the Kentucky Oaks, it seemed like she was an automatic uh, entry into the spinster. But, uh, you know, they they decided to lateral go to the Preakness, uh, you know, I, I have said, and m- myself and my co-host Eric have said on our show that, uh, you know, we think that maybe uh, they, they should reconsider and look at the spinster, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, j- just looking at her, you know, it's a great story that she's in the Preakness, but I have a hard time believing that, number one, she lost the Kentucky Oaks. And I think she dares the devil's a much better horse than people gave her credit for going into the Kentucky Oaks. So obviously, you know, to, to run the kind of race that she ran to beat a Philly like Swiss Skydiver, she has to be super good. But with that being said, I don't think She Dares the Devil would beat any of the horses in this Preakness. And, you know, 
as great of a sporting gesture it is, you know, we saw her get beat already by Art Collector in the Bluegrass, and Art Collector was really the only ta- really talented horse in that race. You know, Rushy is a multiple time winner and did win the the Pat Day Mile on the Kentucky Derby undercard. But those are really the two proven horses that she's faced. And outside of those two, it's a lot of okay and mediocre horses underneath. And I really don't think her not being able to beat Art Collector, who in a race where everything went her way in the bluegrass, I really don't think her not being able to beat him is going to translate to her being able to run a winning race in the Preakness. Now, if you want to, if you want to look at the history angle of it, uh, she's definitely better than Rhea Antonia, which is the most recent filly to run in the Preakness. And so, but Rhea Antonia ran last. So if you're comfortable, it's fairly easy to say she'll not run last in here, but I just don't see a reason why Swiss Skydiver would be able to, to turn around when she wasn't able to beat Art Collector. I can't see her beating Art Collector plus Authentic and several of the other good horses in here. 100% agree. You can't. She was faced. Okay, horse she's been facing. She dares the devil. She couldn't beat. And, but to lose by three and a half lengths, and then you run a, a three and a half lengths to Art Collector, and it's not like it was close. She, our collector clearly pulled away. I just do not think this horse is a links candidate in this race. Especially at 6-1. to one. That's too low. And uh, I'm going to disagree with you guys again. I think she is a major player in here. Now, you guys think... Uh, let me just get an idea, actually. This is for both of you. Where do you think she's sitting in here? Right near the lead. I think she's on the lead. I think it's going to be... I think. I'll give what I think my two my, my horses on the lead. I think it's her, Art Collector, and Authentic. Those three on the lead. Okay, so yeah. you, you go ahead, Sammy. Swiss Skydiver runs her best on the lead. She runs her Pretty best cool. on the lead, but she's had success rating before. I'm not really too worried about it. I think it would be in her best interest to let a couple of horses go in here. To let... Uh, Art Collector go, let New York Traffic go, and let Authentic go. That's obviously what I think in my pace projector. Obviously, everybody has different ideas of who's going to be in front, and those are the three I think are going to be vying for the lead. She might get a nice trip sitting right in behind those. Now, obviously, you don't want her to get bobbled up inside, but eventually some kind of ground is probably going to open up, and I have every confidence that Robbie Alvarado will be able to find it. Do I think she's good enough to win? No. I don't think she's beating Art Collector. Art Collector obviously showed that he's better than her back in the Bluegrass. However, her Alabama, over a mile and a quarter, you could say who she was facing. The race got a very big fig on a track that wasn't playing that fast. And her Kentucky Oaks was just fine uh, behind that uh, weird performance from She There's the Devil. Uh, you could say what you want about Brad Cox, but I don't know how that horse won that race other than uh, some miraculous improvement through various means. And uh, now she dares the devil is apparently the second leading female in the country. Yeah, that's how stupid uh, voters are in our sport, people. But uh, I think she's just fine. And being that she's 6-1, to one, why am I going to use Authentic, who I respect, obviously won the Derby, why am I going to put him third when I could put a 6-1 to one shot third? So she's going to be my third choice in here to try and make some money in the triples. Number five is Thousand Words. I'm sure Baffert would love to see this horse win. Well, looking at Thousand Words, you know, his last two races were definitely a significant improvement since the Oakland Stakes, which, you know, if you're, you're looking at this horse, it's a complete line. That race is a complete line through. He basically tried to eat dirt from the start of the, that race. That race is a complete line through. I have actually come around a lot on this horse. I Going into the Kentucky Derby, and it, it wasn't really as much of looking at the Oakland stakes. I was really turned off by the performance in the San Felipe, but he's definitely turned around since then. He, you know, his second place finish in the Los Alamitos Derby was good enough, even though Uncle Chuck did get throttled by Tis the Law in the Travers. It was a good enough race there. And he, he also did run a good race in the shared belief, even though I do think that, uh, you know, there were there were a mountain list of reasons why, you know, you can look at those two races and not be super impressed by them. The one thing I don't like is the blinkers go back on to this say. race. And, you, you know, you look at you may have started to see a bit of a turnaround with with the last two races with not having the blinkers. But 
Blinkers go back on now. Not the biggest fan. Not the biggest fan of that. But I will say I do think he's a better horse than I originally had given him credit for. Uh, now is that good enough to run uh, in the money race here? I don't know. He could be one of those horses that gets a very nice position. And if the you know if he's far enough back that you know he's not uh, getting caught in a potential meltdown, but he's close enough that he's not completely out of it, he could be in a very nice position. But that that's all speculative at this point. The blinkers coming back on. He seemed to he he massive he improved a lot when the blinkers came off. Now they're putting it back on, which I'm a little spectacle of that. You're a spectacle. Your eyeglasses. Skeptical. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. My 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 spectacles are just fine. Uh, here, with thousand words, I picked this horse fourth in the Derby before the. Uh, the late scratch in the paddock. I'm obviously in love with the other Bob Angle. But here's the thing. Other than the shared belief win, I just don't see any race in here that makes him a win candidate. I originally, when I was thinking about this race maybe a week or two ago, I thought I was going to pick him. And then my brain started to work, and I decided I wasn't. Looking back, the shared belief win was a walk on the front end, I thought he might have gotten a nice trip in the Derby. That's why I used him for fourth. Uh, obviously, he didn't even get a chance to run in the Derby. In this race, though, like, uh, which one of you two said he might get the good setup in here? I said that. So Jack said that. I agree. If you look at my pace projector, I have him fifth or sixth in here. He might get a really, really, really nice trip uh, in the middle of the pack. Uh, and set to set up nice form with uh, some fast to moderate fractions. Uh, I just don't think he's good enough. And uh, it, I hope there's two horses in here, Thousand Words in New York Traffic, that I was very high on going into the Derby and that I'm not high on now. And I really don't want them to kick my ass. But it's Bob Baffert's longer price. He very well could. Number six is... Jesus's team, or as I said for a million times, Jesus's team, if you want to go with that. Uh, Jack, your thoughts on Jesus's team? This is a horse that I've been, you know, interested in in his last couple of races. I thought that his second place finish to Sole Volante uh, in the June 10th allowance race at Gulfstream was a, a performance that could set him up to run well in some stakes races. You know, he had the fourth place finish in Haskell, uh, the second place finish in the, the Pegasus stakes where, you know, he closed into a horse pneumatic who was obviously superior on the day, was being geared down by Joe Bravo. Uh, you know, I thought he had the potential to step up uh, in, in the Jim Dandy and not run a winning race, but a, at least uh, run back up to that confidence. But I, I don't like him coming in. I'm kind of off of him. Uh, following the the effort that he had in the Jim Danny, he just you know it looked like for I don't want to say it looked like he was going to win because I think Mystic Guy was obviously the best horse on the day, but he flattened out a lot in the stretch in the Jim Danny, and I don't like seeing that there. I just think that this is the example of a horse that it, it's just in a little bit over his head. He's never really put together something that the kind of race that says this horse is going to run well. In, in a lower level graded stakes, much less the Preakness. So I'm off of Jesus' team coming into this race. Don't think Jesus' team is good enough in this race. Like what Jack said, they're a little bit over their head here. I would be, a, I would be surprised if this horse wins. Yeah, I'd be surprised if he won. He's another horse where I, I thought I'd throw him out, and then I looked at him again, and some of his races definitely allow him to get a piece in here. But he just wasn't good enough to get into the top four. I completely understand using him on the bottom, uh, the bottom of uh, triples and supers. He's a stalker that might be uh, mid mid pack in here, just because there's a lot of horses looking for forward position. He might be a little bit further towards the back, and that's not too bad of a setup. He could definitely come running late. I like him a lot better than the one in here uh, to come running late. Uh, so I definitely understand if you like him a little bit, but uh, just just doesn't get there for me. Number seven is uh, something I'm used to all the time: New York traffic. I think New York traffic is the prototypical example of a horse that 
in, in stakes races that were not the Kentucky Derby, just consistently wasn't good enough to get the, the top position in there. Obviously, he had the third the third straight finishes in the graded stakes efforts. Really good effort behind Maxfield and Matt Wynn. Almost caught authentic in the Haskell. The the fairground, or excuse me, the Louisiana Derby was not really something that I, I was very impressed by. It just seemed like he kind of stayed in the same position the entire time in the race and never really closed into Wells Bayou. But, you know, a lot of people really liked him going into the Kentucky Derby, and you could obviously see why. But the eighth place finish in the Kentucky Derby, very turned off by that. I, I think that that's just indicative of a horse that, you know, can fire a big shot uh, on days where he's not running against uh, multiple great horses like he was in the Kentucky Derby. You know, he can run a very good race against a max field or an authentic in a race just against them. But uh, when you put multiple horses like authentics and tis the laws in the same race, I don't really it, it see New York traffic ever really having any kind of uh, win, win type in that. And I think that, you know, the Kentucky Derby was just complete, like I said already, completely indicative of the, the horse that he is. I'm off him coming into the Preakness. All right, Sammy, go ahead. Tell us what you learned. Actually, I'm actually throwing out the Kentucky Derby after what I read. You could throw out losing the shoe. That That's not the most important, but for him, he bled in the race and got injured, and it must have been bad enough that he had to get staples in his ankle, and it took like a couple weeks for him to get back. But like what Jack said, he's just, I feel like he's just a hanger, and He's a hanger in the greatest stakes races. I do not like that that Paco Lopez is com- is getting off the horse, but that doesn't really affect a lot. I just don't think he, he just seems to run second, third, fourth in these big kind of races. Yeah, which which is fine. And New York traffic was my second choice in the Derby because I thought that the pace wouldn't be that fast that he'd hang around being up front. Well, he was up front. The pace wasn't slow, but the two horses that ran 1-2 were right close to the pace, on the pace and then second or third the whole time. I realized what happened to him with the cuts. He shouldn't have dropped that far back. I was very turned off by the Derby, just like Jack. And I, I wish I didn't have to, but I'm not using him here. Uh, I was going to use him, but... Ultimately, like Thousand Words, my brain started uh, over out, outdoing my uh, sentiment. Number eight is uh, Linda Rice's. Oh, Roy, we got to mention that again. It's not Linda Rice. It's another Steve Asmussen horse, Max Player. Does he get another check this time? I think that Max Player is a really consistent good runner. You know, going back to his time with Linda Rice, he had the win in the Withers. You know, a lot of people coming out of that race were questioning the talent that he had, including uh, myself, uh, my co-host, and other people that I had talked to in the industry. Really didn't know what to make of Max Player. But the two third-place finishes in the Belmont and the Travers really validated him as a racehorse. And, you know, he's the typical example of a horse that will run fifth in the Kentucky Derby that, you know, the number five doesn't look great on the chart. But when you go back and watch the Kentucky Derby, he ran a very good race, a sneaky good race in there. You know, you obviously wouldn't call it a great race, but – I, I think that the Preakness could definitely benefit him more more so than the Derby would because I do think some of the horses on the lead will be backing up. I don't think he's a win candidate. I, I don't think that New York tra- – or that, excuse me, Max Player uh, is a horse that's a, the, the type of horse that's going to win races like this, but I do think he, he is the type of consistent horse to continue picking up the checks, and that's why uh, I included him for second. A little bit ambitious with that, but I, I do really like – uh, his ability to close and run well in these big races. He's a very talented horse. I feel like he deserves more credit for what he's done. He's just, he's he's a talented horse, runs third, fifth. I don't think it was the best of rides by Ricardo in the Derby, but it wasn't terrible. He really had nowhere else to go, so you can't really blame him. And I feel like he, he's a contender in this race to run second, third, maybe even get a, maybe even win. Max player to me, I love these horses. They show up, they run a good race, and they get money to the owners, the trainer, and the jock. You can't ever let down an honest horse. Max player, I think he'll probably run fifth again. Uh, He's going to be probably, I would guess, uh, 
9th, 10th, or 11th in here early on. Just going to try and make that one run. And uh, he's definitely going to have horses that are tiring that he's going to be able to pass. Is he going to be able to pass them all? I doubt it. Uh, I'd love to use him. Uh, I just can't. I just don't think he's uh, going to get the right setup. And I think he's just a, a cut below. But I can't fault him at all for being who he is. Number nine is the drug horse. Nah, I'm kidding. Or am I? Number nine is authentic. Uh, the winner of the Kentucky Derby, who either was drugged or was a lot better than everybody thought he was. Who knows? We do know he won the race. We do know he turned back, uh, who I still believe to be the best three-year-old in this division. I don't think that just by winning one race, that puts authentic ahead. It is the law. But you have to give him at least some sort of respect after running that derby and running a pretty decent time in it, too. Uh, Jack, what do you think about the 9-5 to five favorite? I think that Authentic coming into this race, they said this already, I think Authentic's a freak of an animal. You know, a, you know everyone said what they've said about Authentic. You know, I, I've, I'm always pride myself as being the person of, uh, you know, innocent until proven guilty. And to right now at this point, I think all that conversation is just hearsay. Regardless of, regardless of what people may feel, Authentic ran a super impressive Kentucky Derby, one of the more impressive Kentucky Derbies in recent memory. He broke from the outside gate. I know it was only 15 horses, but still breaking from the outside and having to be a speed horse that needed the lead. He had to go up there. It wasn't easy for him to get up there. And once he got up there, he, it's not like he was crawling on the front end. He ran very fast fractions uh, while winning the race wire to wire. And he took the challenge from Tizzle on. He turned him back in the strip. You know, I said that, that there were a lot of things that I would pick to happen in horse racing before I would pick an into mischief uh, winning the Kentucky Derby. Uh, you know, it, it, maybe it was bound to happen at some point. But I think Authentic was just it, – it's just a freaky horse in and, of him, in and of himself. I thought going into the Derby he was the second or third most talented horse in the crop. Obviously, I still think Tisla Law is more talented. But in a race where Authentic had everything go his way – I think he ran, you know, obviously ran a career best, definitely freaked that day. Uh, the time's super nice. Everything's super nice about the Kentucky Derby. And I think he's the obvious horse to beat in here. And, you know, I was kind of against picking the winner of the Kentucky Derby just because I do think that there's some reasons to go against him. Because of that, I did go against him. But I fully expect Authentic to run a very similar race to the Kentucky Derby. And I think if you don't consider him, uh, for very, for at least a win or very close uh, to, to winning the race, either a second or a third, then uh, you're doing yourself an extreme disservice. Contain me to say, I'm, I'm picking off the next. He turned just the way he ran that derby. It was ultra impressive. I mean, I, I'll admit it, he proved me wrong. I never would have thought he would have got 10 furlongs. Just give credit to John Velasquez. What a beautiful ride on, on Authentic he gave. And I just like Authentic. My gut is telling me he's going to win. That's really... He's just a game horse, and hopefully I win this race, sadly. All right, guys. So you two both said you think Swiss Skydiver is going to be in front. So obviously uh, that means Authentic will not be in front in this race. Am I going to take a 9-5 to five horse who's run all his best races when he's been right on the lead? And he's probably going to... He, I think he's going to be three wide going into the first turn. And he might be wide going into the far turn. Look. Obviously... I Look, the horse... The horse is great. The horse knocked down Bob Baffert in the winner's circle. That was hilarious. That was the highlight of the whole day. I don't want to see this horse win. I love Johnny Velasquez. That that Derby, I still I still can't get over it. Maybe it was just because Tis the Law lost. Now I didn't have any money on the Derby. It was purely of rooting interest. I don't want to see this horse win at nine to five and give Baffert another Preakness win. And realistically. If you're trying to make money, which I really don't plan on betting this race, but if I was, 
and I was playing triples, I want to try and get him out of the triple because that's how you make money. So I'm going to put him fourth. I suggest that if you're betting substantial money, you that means you already have enough of a budget, you have to include him in your exactors. You have to include him in your triples, your supers. Obviously, multi-race bets, he has to be used. But if you're playing small bets like me, a guy who doesn't have a lot of money to splurge and doesn't mind losing three, three, six, nine bucks on a race, try and get him out of it and try and use some other horses to try and make some nice bang for your buck. I completely respect him. I don't know if I'm respecting him because of his ability or if I'm respecting him because of something else, but he has to be used in this race. I just am trying to make other people money and if I play myself money that's why I'm putting him forth he absolutely off that race is the horse to beat and I don't like saying that anybody's the horse to beat in a race but authentic's the horse to beat here we'll add one more point on authentic uh he he also did get a very beneficial post draw you know as the Derby showed, it doesn't bother him to to be wide in a situation like that the two speed horses the two other committed speed horse at least in my opinion drew inside of him you've also got a horse new york traffic who can be near lead i don't think that that's necessarily where he wants to be but all speed drew inside of him which is a good thing for him uh it, it is also worth mentioning that bob baffert has never won never lost the preakness with a derby winner he's five for five coming over and he's absolutely owned pimlico seven times a winner of the preakness states one more puts him solely in possession of the record so Obviously, Bob Baffert at Pimlico on Preakness Day is not a bad angle. Sammy, did you have something else to say? Thing was, on the I like what Andrew said of picking authentic. It's not that I'm. I don't even know if I'm going to cheer for him. I just think he's probably going to win this race. And I was really thinking, do I just go with who I'm rooting for, or do I go who I actually think I'm going to, who I think is probably going to win the race? So I just went with the horse. That I think is probably going to win the race. That that's that's absolutely fine, Sammy. Now, Jack, I'm going to disagree with you on something very respect very respectfully. I think Johnny Velasquez's best option is to just do what he did last time and go. I don't think that's going to happen. I think they're going to be aggressive with our collector. That, that that's one opinion that a lot of people don't have. I think. Because of how well our collectors run on the lead before through strong paces, that they're the most inside, they should go. And I don't know if uh, if Velasquez, he might think he has the horse to sit outside and be just fine. In my opinion, that hurts him. If Authentic gets to the lead, he's twice as dangerous as he is without the lead. I don't think he's going to be on the lead. Obviously, you two think Swiss is going to be on the lead. Uh, if I knew Authentic was going to the front, I would have put him second because I still would have tried to beat him. But I don't think that drawing outside, drawing outside the other speeds works for a horse like Tis the Law who loves to sit just out, uh, just behind other horses. I don't know if it works for somebody who has done their best running in their whole lives, including a race where nobody thought he was going to get a mile and a quarter uh, when he's on the lead. All right, so I guess we're moving on. Number 10 is Pneumatic. This is the thing that all the elves uh, get on when they uh, go to the Central Square in the North Pole and the Polar Express. They go in the Pneumatic. Uh, so Sammy wants to introduce this horse so he can go right ahead. Well, part of the reason was because you guys both like him, I heard. But I'm, I'm not so sure about Pneumatic. Because, think about it. Okay, he won at Pegasus. Who was in that field again? Jesus' team. Okay, who else is there? Nobody. And he, even in his debut, he beat Skull Factor, who came back to run like eighth in the line with the Delaware Park. I think for him to be really competitive in this race, he's going to have to get that trip he got in his allowance race. I would have preferred Ricardo on this horse, but... But then you look at the Matt win. He just got beaten. By Mastro in New York traffic. And then you go to the Belmont, he couldn't get better than fourth against Tis the Law, Dr. Post, and Max Flyer. 
I just don't really see it with this horse. But again, 20 to 1 is high. So I can see where you guys are coming from. And that's actually a point that we made it, it that my co host and I made in our po- or preview over on our YouTube about this. That, you know, and I, I will mention that I, as much praise as I've given Authentic, I, I am going to try to beat him in Pneumatic is the horse that I did uh, select to try to beat him with. That allowance race at Oakland is definitely the formula of what he's going to need to do to win this race. Uh, Joe Bravo is going to have to do what Ricardo did in that allowance and put him in the stalking position. I think, you know, if he gets a very similar trip to the trip that I think that thousand words would need to run a huge race that, you know, that's what he needs to win the Preakness. And I think he can do that. And what Sammy brought up, that's where I disagree with uh, using what kind of horses, what kind of quality horses that he beat, you know, looking at the Pegasus stakes. Yeah. He he only beat Jesus' team by a couple of lengths, but he could have won by a lot more if, he was asked to do more that was a race where obviously they were looking at the future and didn't need didn't need to win by more than two and a quarter lengths and so joe geared him down uh through most of the stretch which was obviously the smart thing to do looking at the matt win obviously obviously max fuel was the best horse on that day but pneumatic ran such a good race there and he was inside a position where he's not going to have to be in this race you know he drew the tech He's an example where you can bring up the, the and not really dispute the the draw really helping him because he's not going to have to deal with uh, a, any speed horses outside of him. He can sit a fairly good position. And, you know, I don't love the Belmont stakes, but I'm also willing. There's also ways that I can look at that and go past that. He did draw. It is worth mentioning. Uh, he did draw the one post, if I'm not mistaken, or he started uh pretty close to the inside am i correct on that or am i uh, uh no he reading? actually was right on the no, outside I'm I, I, I knew i was, when he I knew was, I was post two i knew i was reading that chart wrong I, I knew i was reading that chart wrong but so scratch all that what i just said but the the matt win r- really like the effort that i got from him there really obviously got the re- like what i got from him in the pegasus and then uh you know the belmont there's things that i can look at and say eh, you know didn't love the Belmont, but it also wasn't uh, something that I can look at him and completely toss him out. So he's the horse I'm going to take a shot against with pneumatic. I, I or, or I should say against authentic. I kind of was bouncing around him in thousand words and he was the horse I fell on. All right. Pneumatic was, uh, once I got to him, it, it was a very, very simple pick. And I'll tell you why to me, he's the, he's the best priced, win candidate in the race he has a race fast enough to win and i saw something else that jumped off the page every race he runs he's getting better and that's a great sign for a three-year-old going into the deep fall of the year to see them progressing and getting better throughout their year instead of uh, staying the same uh their whole three-year-old years and maybe they don't get better until they're four this horse has been developing in front of our eyes. Now, the Matt Wynn, he ran an okay race, and despite him finishing third, only beating a length and three quarters there, he still managed to run a better race in the Belmont despite finishing fourth and losing by more. And then, obviously, the Pegasus was sort of his coming-out party. Steve Asmussen, obviously... He sees something in this horse that he's good enough. To, I think they've been pointing to this race for a while, actually. Uh, that was more for the number one horse that they decided to put in here. This horse they've been trying for a long time. I like the last two workouts as well. To see something real fast and then a slower one right before the race, I love that. Horse has also been working out at Saratoga, which we all know has been a deep, tiring track uh, ever since they put the new surface in i like that for him maybe he'll get over this surface even better uh joe bravo obviously i'm fine with him jersey joe uh, ashmussen shipping in 20 percent uh 51 percent in the money if you get 20 to 1 i'll be very surprised i'm picking this horse with the knowledge that i'm probably not getting 20 to 1 he might be 13, 14 to 1. And you know what? That's fine with me. Because to me, that's still a better price than any of the horse, other horses in here. 
that I can say uh, can win. And that would be the top four horses that I picked in here. Our Collector, Swiss Skydiver, Authentic, and then this horse. Those are the four I think can win. He's obviously the best price of the four of them. It was a very, very simple selection. All Touch right. on what I, what I said on thing, on, on pneumatic. All right. Yeah, that was a very easy win in the Pegasus. He, like what Jack said, could have won by more. Also, I don't know if you guys noticed. I just did adjusted time for the Belmont. He, went, he ran 147. I know Tizzle Law ran fast, but that's pretty fast too. Well, that, that takes into account the ground loss. No, that's just the adjusted time. That was his final time when he crossed the wire. Well, that, that track was playing. That track was playing pretty fast. Uh, I don't know. I'd have and, to look at Trackus to see how much ground yeah. he lost. And I just did the statistics with Steve a Steve Asmussen and Joe Bravo. They're fourteen percent together over like the last five years. Uh, that's not great, but it's not. It's not like he's a guy that rides for Asmussen a lot. So no, I'm not really too like worried. like 21 horses, three wins or something. No, it's not. Might have been like that. So I don't know. All right. Finally, uh, we got a long shot on the outside, a literal outsider. Uh, number 11 is Live Your Beast Life for the former Chad Brown assistant, Jorge Abreu. You like anything about him, Jack? Not really. I was very uh, not turned off, but I, I don't think that – the race that he ran in the Jim Dandy was the greatest. Uh, you, you know, I wasn't the biggest fan of any of those three ho top three horses coming out of there. Didn't like Jesus's team already. I'm gonna be very simple with that. Didn't like Jesus's team. Don't really see a lot with Live Your Beast Life. I know there's things that that Sammy's definitely gonna touch on with him. You know, closing in that race. I really just don't think it it, it really is gonna play that much into it. Uh, you know, Mystic Guide was closing from a lot more or was closing from farther back and you know he still ran a better better race than live your beast life i just think that he's a cup below i'm going to disagree here he's he's improving every star if you look back at his past performances after he ran after he steadied and pretty much lost all chance to start in december he his speed i know the buyers aren't everything but I just look at it for improvement. He goes 49, 67, 71, 83, 85, and 94. So there's improvement there, which you like to see. And then he closes on a, a track where he had to drop back, turning for home, and it was that track just all speed by. So you've got to give him credit for even closing on that track. And the, what, what was there, 10 gate to wire winners that day? It was incredible. And I just And I just feel like he's the type of horse that might – Run a big one and might run second, third, right there. And my and I'm actually going to be cheering for him because my buddy Trevor McCarthy's riding, so I'm going to cheer for him in this race. Yeah, Live Your Beast Life's another one of those horses where if you think he's going to come from the back and make a nice run, I totally understand using him in the bottom of the exotics. Fine with me if you want to do that. He's just uh, not good enough for me. Here's the one thing about that track bias, Sammy. I, I was talking about uh, that with you before the video, and then I saw the fractions of this Jim Dandy, and I noticed that the 47 and 3 and the 111 and 2, despite being uh, on a speed bias track, which it obviously was, those are about as fast of fractions as any mile and a third race this year at Saratoga. They were going slow as shit. In pretty much every mile in an eighth race you could imagine, or any two-turn race uh, you could imagine. It's a joke uh, what they were uh, getting away with. So even though it's a speed bias track, that is a fine pace to close into. Obviously, it's not that easy, and he was very wide into the turn. If he runs that race, he definitely has a chance to run better than mid-pack in here. Uh, I just don't trust them. I just... I've never seen him beat at anything close to this field. Now, you can say the same thing about Pneumatic, but uh, I don't think this horse is nearly as talented as Pneumatic is. So, I unfortunately had to leave him out. So, that will do it for our uh, run through the field here of Preakness 145. 
Now it is selection time. Obviously, we kind of gave them away already. I'll start us off and finish my talking quickly. I like Pneumatic taking a shot with what I believe is the best horse that can win uh, at the biggest price. I like him over Art Collector, who I think is going to run a super race and hang around for a long time on the front end. Uh, Pimlico, usually the rail's good. Hopefully the rail doesn't become dead for the uh, third time in Pimlico history on Saturday. Uh, number four, Swiss Skydiver, third. I know you two don't like her that much. I think she's run some great races, and I think she's better than the, the bulk of this field. And then Authentic, out of respect, I'm going to put fourth. Uh, I wouldn't mind seeing him lose. Like I mentioned, I like I mentioned already, super respect authentic. Think he's an extremely talented racehorse, but I did try to beat him. Obviously, as I already mentioned, went with pneumatic on top. I'm going to throw Max player in for second. I do think that he's going to get a very beneficial pace, and I think that he can close. And you know, Pemlico's not a track that's anti closers. We've seen uh, closers be able to run very well. I think that Owendale closing ran a really good race last year. Uh, just uh, obviously Everfast was able to sneak up the rail, uh, you know, just looking at last year. So I'm going to put him second. Uh, again, keeping the respect with Authentic, I put him third. Uh, and then I put Mr. Big News in for fourth just to kind of have a little fun with throwing around all the all the horses that are going to be com coming pretty late. Uh, you know, that's just kind of the, my fourth pick was just kind of a throwaway just to throw someone in at the bottom. Uh, but I feel really strong about that top three. I'm going with Authentic on top. Live your beast life second. Um, I'm gonna throw a pneumatic in for. Now actually, I'm gonna throw arc collector in for third and pneumatic for fourth. So nine, eleven, ten, nine, eleven, three, ten. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I appreciate you uh, coming on the show today. For those of you who want to watch the Preakness, I'll be watching it in a hotel room in Pennsylvania on Saturday before I go kayaking the next day. Uh, you can watch the less than pleasing coverage on NBC starting at 4.30. Post time for the race is 5.36. Uh, I unfortunately, because of going on this trip this weekend, I have to do a shit ton of work this week, uh, the next few days before I head out to PA. So I am not going to have time to do any videos for the Belmont Derby, the Joe Hirsch Turf Classic, the Bell Dame, or any of the races at Belmont this weekend. So I'm very, I'm very sorry about that. I would love to do it. I'll definitely have a video for the Jockey Club Gold Cup next week and some of the other races on October 10th that weekend. Try to get Dennis on here to participate in some of that. Uh, I'm not even going to be able to watch Belmont on uh, Thursday or Friday. Uh, coming up but we really appreciate you guys watching this we hope you have a great time this weekend no matter what track you're playing Pimlico Belmont uh, if you're for some reason you're playing San Anita I don't know why but good luck if you play there thank you for watching this instead of the presidential debate anything else guys Keeneland's this weekend going to be a good time. We don't have, uh, unfortunately, entries aren't out, so we can't talk about that. But Keeneland's got a super nice card as well. So lots of fun racing. The, the next two weeks are absolutely loaded with great racing. So th this is the best time of the year, I always say. Just one kind of final thought. This is the best time of year. Right before Breeders' Cup scramble, everyone running in all these big races. Enjoy it. Sammy, anything else? And the mic is dead. Okay, so that'll be it, everybody. Thanks very much for listening. My favorite time of the year is obviously Belmont Stakes Day and the Belmont Spring Summer Meet, but that's me. It is a damn good time for horse racing. We are at Belmont, so that's always good. Screw you, Cuomo, for not letting us in. Thanks for watching, and remember, pay your bills first. Good luck in the Preakness.